Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Bikes or Death podcast. My name is Patrick, and I am your host. And uh, I want to start out first by thanking our newest patron, Kathleen B. She's the only one we got this week. So if you'd like to join her in supporting the show, you can find a link to that Patreon account over at bikesordeath.com. There's also a PayPal button if you just want to give a one-time donation. If you think this or another episode is pretty great, maybe you just want to say thanks and kick a couple dollars my way. While you're there, check out the web store. We've got some cool merchandise available and more is coming. I've got two new styles of shirts that are on the way and about to order some volet straps, which have been a hot demand item. So go over there, check out that fun stuff. I got for y'all. Everything that you contribute goes to help support the show, support me and its growth, and is much appreciated. Now, in today's episode, I have a special man named Mr. Dave Nice. He goes by Fixie Dave on Instagram, and maybe that'll tell you everything you need to know about him. He rides Fixie. More importantly, though, he attempted the tour divide. Oh gosh, it was either five or six times before he finally completed it on a fixie. It's a great story, truly inspiring, and really an all-around, I hate to say it, nice guy. He was great to chat with, and I appreciate that he is part of Team Bike. He certainly brings a lot to the community. I appreciate his time to come on and chat with me on the podcast and share his story to the masses. All right, everyone. Sorry it's been a few weeks since I put out an episode. Things have gotten kind of crazy in my personal life, but I've got the next two episodes already recorded. So those are being edited, and hopefully I'll be able to get those out to you in the next couple of weeks. All right. Well, that's all I got for you right now. Short and sweet. What do you say? We just get to the show. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your bars, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes. Oh, death. Bikes. Oh, 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 death. Podcast. All right. Well, David Nice. Is that your real name, by the way? Is David Nice your real name? Uh, it is. David uh, Michael Nice. It's a very nice uh, name. You know, when, when I uh, hear... People call me David, though. I uh, kind of turn around looking for my dad or my mom. So uh, most of my friends just call me Dave. So okay. we'll get to know. Thanks, Dave. I understand from the interwebs that you have an affinity towards beer. Are you uh, imbibing on one this evening? Recently, well, about a year ago, I was uh, diagnosed with kind of uh, some pre-diabetic stuff. So I've been uh, ratcheting the beer back quite a lot. I still enjoy beer a lot. I've got a glass of red wine, though, tonight. So oh, excellent. Well, I'm having a whiskey to join you. But yeah, that's unfortunate. Are you changing your diet a lot to kind of counter that, obviously? Been trying to limit the uh, the carb intake to about 40 carbs or so a meal. It gets a little interesting on the bike for sure, especially with how I'm used to pedaling. Kind of slowly figuring it out with, with the bike and, and whatnot. I don't want to continue down the uh, type 2 diabetic route. So trying to let my uh, body do what it needs to naturally as best as possible. So, Well, I have a good story. I'll tell you real quick. It's not related to bikes as much, but um, since we're on the topic, uh, my mom probably 10 or 15 years ago got diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes and her uh, doctor put her, uh, put her on a medicine and said, you know, take this and come back in a month and we'll, we'll test your levels. So she came back in a month and the levels were great and the doctor was really happy that the medicine worked. And that's when she informed the doctor that she never took any of the medicine and she just changed her diet. And I don't know, there's two things I take away from that. One, it's sad that doctors, not all of them, I don't want to, you know, say anything bad about doctors. I love doctors, <laughs> but uh, the, 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 I think just we in general tend to look for a pill for whatever reason in society we tend to look for a pill, but there's a lot of things we can do. Is that kind of been your approach too? 
Yeah, I'm I'm on uh, one kind of pretty minuscule amount of metformin, which basically is supposed to help your cells do stuff a little better. But mainly, I'm just diet change and been uh, trying to do a little bit more intensity workouts here and there, rather than just kind of the slow and steady diesel pace that you know I've done in the past. Uh, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Just turned forty on the third. Okay. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I just turned 40. Well, in February, so I thought we were uh, similar in age. Just just looking at your pictures on Instagram. <laughs> um, and where where do you live and and work at? Just as a way to kind of get to know you, I'm kind of curious, like where you, where you live and what you do for a living. So uh, I live in uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado, for about the last year or so. I've worked for the pedal station which is kind of a community bike shop. It's owned and run by Kids on Bikes, which is a nonprofit here in Colorado Springs. And it's the social enterprise portion of Kids on Bikes. So we take donated bikes and we either fix them up for the bike libraries that are scattered around a D11 school district. And if we can't utilize the bikes for that, uh, then we fix them up and uh, sell them on our retail floor. And uh, that money helps all the programs. So it's pretty cool. I, my title, I think, is uh, head mechanic slash volunteer coordinator. And uh, we've got a number of volunteers. And it's been one of the more satisfying bike shop jobs I've had. Oh, I can't imagine. That sounds ideal. What was it? It was pedaled what? It's called the pedal station. The pedal station. I was go- trying to Google it. The Kids on Bikes has reached out to me about doing a podcast, and I, I'd love to do that. I didn't even realize that you were here. We are the pedal station. Yeah, I just wanted to take a look. Man, that's wonderful. So um, you said you've only been doing that for a year? Yeah, I've, I've only been paid <laughs> for, for a year. Basically, uh, when I moved to, to the Springs about six years ago, I was very quickly introduced to the executive director, Daniel Bird, and I've done a lot of volunteering. And in 2016, I rode about 2,000 miles of the Route 66 route as a fundraiser. And I think I raised around $7,000 that year for kids on bikes. And you know, so it's been on my radar for a very long time. So when the opportunity came through a bunch of kind of odd circumstances to get there, I took the uh, opportunity and, you know, it's been a, a pretty awesome fit, I feel like. Yeah. What were you doing prior to that? I had been a mechanic at a shop called Cafe Velo, and uh, the owner decided to shut that shop down. And kind of in the interim time, I uh, worked very part-time for the uh, bike share in Colorado Springs called Pike Ride. And then I kind of did a little bit of uh, wrenching for friends and at uh, one of the bars uh, near one of the trailheads, uh, let me set up and do some uh, quick tunes and uh, piecemeal repair work. And I kind of use that as my interim work, so to speak, <laughs> between Cafe Velo and pedal station job. What was the overlap there with, did you kind of ramp up with the pedal station and, and just being more available once you were not employed anymore? Fully, I guess? A little bit of that. And they have been steadily getting busier and busier, more donations. And, uh, they're looking for a person with a little bit more in-depth mechanical experience to kind of help step it up another level. Yeah, it was it just kind of, uh, you know, sometimes the universe works out really well that way. Yeah, it does oftentimes, I find. If I don't know, you're just pursuing something, it, things tend to work out. Not all the time, but sometimes they do. The bike gods shine, shine down upon you. So how has uh, COVID and everything going on impacted this? So it, 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 this is part business, part uh, philanthropy. Mm-hmm. So I, I yeah, mean, maybe, it, maybe you can even paint a better picture of what all they do. I think it would be interesting to know a little bit more about them. So you said you were fixing bikes. Are y'all just selling those at like a good price so kids can afford them or what? What do y'all got going on there? So it's, we're probably selling a lot of stuff a little bit below market value or, or similar to like, you know, Craigslist or Facebook marketplace, but they've been gone through and checked over. So there's, you know, if 
cable needs replacing, it's been replaced. And, you know, it's an opportunity for someone to have a, a, a lower cost bike that has been thoroughly vetted and uh, checked over. So they aren't going to get a limb in or it's not going to fall apart for right. them real quick. And want them on um, a good safe bike with brakes and yeah, yeah that just works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've worked in shops that had bike builds that, you know, are in 10, $12,000 range, full DI2 and carbon everything and all that. And uh, there's something uh, immensely more satisfying, at least to me, of someone that's rediscovering cycling or getting on a bike for a first time. And, you know, they want to only spend, you know, two or three hundred dollars to test the waters and get back into it or try it out. And that's, I, you know, I feel like we're hopefully helping a really good experience happen versus saying buying a bike at Walmart or Target or that was put together by, you know, a teenager that didn't really know what he was doing or, you know, that well, sort of thing. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, pictures floating around social media of bikes improperly installed at Walmart or Target or whatnot. So it's scary. It's scary. So and I'm guessing and you also do like education and y'all do rides with kids and stuff like that, too. I'm actually on your website says you do like summer bike camp. So is any of that like going on right now? I'm not as involved with the, uh, the camp side of yeah, uh, no worries. <laughs> stuff, but uh, you know, this past summer, I think we still managed to have about 500 kids involved in our camps. Things definitely had to be restructured very differently working with uh, El Paso County, the county that we're located in and their health department department and uh you know following their guidelines and we had much smaller groups than we have in the past so we definitely weren't able to do as much with as many kids but we still managed to have that happen this past summer uh we're looking at fall camps because a lot of after school programs aren't able to run and you know even during uh quarantine we managed to get a online earn a bike program for some of the lower income kids in kind of the southeast corner of uh, Colorado Springs um, on bikes, even through the whole quarantine and whatnot. So, yeah. Have you all seen the same kind of like uptick in people riding bikes that demand on bikes, et cetera, et cetera, that everyone else seems to be seeing? Oh, man, it, I've not seen anything like this in my 25 years plus of being involved in bike shops and the cycling industry and it's been kind of nutty yeah the whole world is nutty right now and the bike industry is a little microcosm of it but it's nice to see i'm hoping that you know after all the dust settles we'll have more cyclists out there uh sharing the roads so As gonna, do I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes sir so your nickname is fixie dave so how'd you get that nickname, Fixie Dave? So I don't remember the exact first person that started calling me Fixie Dave, but back in uh, 2000, 2001, I was in Boulder, Colorado, and I was going to cooking school at the time. And that winter was especially cold and I don't drive or own a car, so I pedal everywhere. Well, that winter was so cold that I kept having the poles in a freewheel freeze up in the grease and I couldn't pedal anywhere. And the, the bike shop that I was hanging out at the time called uh, Full Cycle in Boulder, there was an old ex-messenger from Minneapolis. His name's Bill Whitty. He uh, said, well, Dave, you need a fixie. You need a, a track bike. You need something that doesn't coast. There's no mechanism that can freeze up in the stone age of, uh, you know, the internet and blogs and whatnot, I started searching around and I, uh, discovered Matt Chester online, fixed gear gallery, whole slew of sites. And I was really intrigued by it and got together a, uh, kind of a dumpster fixie together and just fell in love with that connection to the ground and whatnot. And a few of the guys at the shop just started calling me Fixie Dave because I'd show up for, you know, even trail rides on that bike. And I just uh, kind of fell in love with it. And only recently have I bought a used bike that has a freewheel and I only <laughs> occasionally pedal it and coast. Um, 
So you're pretty hardcore uh, committed so to the fixie and have been for, gosh, 20 years now. It's been a while. And, you know, I uh, started racing single speed, you know, 2001, 2002, up at Winter Park. And um, one of the races, my bike that coasted at the time was broken. So I raced uh, one of the Winter Park Series races uh, fixed. And it really didn't slow me down that much. And I just had a had a blast with it. So, you know, I kind of just stuck with it and kind of got rid of all, all my, you know, suspension forks and all the dangly bits and gears mm-hmm. and shift levers. And about the same time I started, you know, working part-time in shops to feed my cycling habit, um, you know, to get parts at cost or, you know, cheaper. And um, I also found that I enjoy working on bikes but uh, the last thing I want to do when I get home <laughs> after working on pe- other people's bikes all day is work on my own stuff. Yeah. So the, the fix here definitely allows for a lot more put away wet and uh, not have to deal with as much with your own bike at home. I f- it's funny. I don't know if you know Vince Calvin, who um, is one of the owners of Chumba. But when I interviewed him, he's, he's a hardcore single speed guy. And that was one of his uh, answers as well is just, I don't want to work on my own bike. I just want to go ride, you know, <laughs> I want to dial on the air pressure and, and just go ride. Before you got into Fixie, were you already single speed? Cause you say you were single speed racing in 2001. So where were you at with that? I was, you know, mountain bike, single speeding, you know, about the same time that I was going to cooking school. And again, uh, the shop on the hill in Boulder, full cycle, I would take my leftovers from cooking school and feed the guys and hang out and ask them a bunch of dumb questions and get them to let me uh, help them build bikes. And they brought in uh, a couple of one by one frames before Surly was bought by QBP. And so I think I bought the third one by one frame in the state of Colorado back in 2000 and fell in love with it. It put me down this kind of single-minded, one-speed kind of path, so to speak. Yeah. That doesn't happen to be the same Surly I saw on your Instagram, is it? Nope. Okay. Yeah, it looked like it. Well, no, that was an ECR. I remember now. I remember now. It's an ECR, right? That's kind of my main um, off-road rig right now. I want to, uh, I definitely want to talk more about the Fixie, but I'm also curious How long has it been since you owned a car? So in 2015, um, when I was 15 years old, I had one of my first uh, seizures. So I've actually never have had a driver's license or owned a car. Oh, okay. You you couldn't. Or, or, yeah, I don't know if they wouldn't let you or if you wouldn't let yourself, but it wasn't really an option. Uh, Both. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> fair enough well yeah i was gonna say you know it's not that uncommon you know in our community for people i know plenty of people who don't own cars uh but you know they probably used to own a car at some point but i also recently found out that when we were setting up this interview you don't have a cell phone either so you're having to you know call from work or your girlfriend's phone or whatever which i got to thinking about it and you are the only person over the age of 18 that i know that doesn't have a cell phone. So how long have you not had a cell phone for? Oh, probably about four years or so. So what precipitated that? I was doing a prepaid cell phone and um, I just was doing a cost breakdown of it. And it just, it didn't make sense for me for how much I was using it. I much prefer to email somebody or meet them in person, you know, rather than call them on the phone necessarily. So golly, at the time I was also paying for like a, uh, for some of the crazy races and such, I was paying for a spot tracker and there were some other very expensive expenses technology wise that I was paying for. So it just didn't seem to fit in. So what about, so I know you're on Instagram and stuff like, how do you how do you do that without a cell phone, I guess, or I guess you have a computer? Well, I I use a, a iPad, and I recently got a hotspot just with work and how much uh, communication I needed to mm. to accomplish on off hours. And um, I got it back in January, which was 
kind of fortuitous uh, with all the COVID stuff. It's become a pretty <laughs> handy little device uh, to have um, for both m- myself and my girlfriend. Um, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I didn't think about an iPod. That's smart. If you're not talking to people very much, an iPod has your camera. You could message. Um, you can do, you know, you can do some stuff on there. You just don't call people. And actually, you can call people through, like, Instagram and stuff like that, too. So, yeah, you really don't need a cell phone plan. Like, my day job, I'm a real estate agent. I have to have a cell phone, you know. But um, I guess it's not that shocking whenever you, whenever I hear you tell it. I was picturing you like living in the stone ages without anything, you know, but then I was like, well, he has Instagram. So how, how does that work? You know, you know, figuring out the workarounds and I guess personally, I, I'm not uh, one that loves, I guess I like communicating on my terms rather than someone <laughs> else's terms. So it's, I have the choice to respond to somebody, you know, on a message on my own time or, or I can turn everything off and uh, be in my own space for a while if I need to be. And, uh, you know, which is, I suppose you can turn off a cell phone too, but there's something about that phone ringing that I feel like you immediately have to answer or, you know, take care of. And uh, I much prefer uh, by text or in-person interactions, I guess. Yeah. Well, I do too. Um, I actually don't like talking on the phone, like these phone, uh, interviews, like I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm having to learn how to, how to do them better. But if I didn't have a real estate as a career, right? Well, I don't think I get rid of my phone. I would be a lot less liberal with its use. And I was actually just saying, I think it was on the last podcast, or maybe I was saying to a friend, uh, that my favorite voicemail to set is the one that says, you know, you've reached Patrick. I'm not available and I'm going to be out of cell phone service for the next five or seven days. Bye-bye. You know, that's like the best message that I can leave. Cause that means I know that it's, it, there is a difference whenever you can flip a switch, you know, and kind of disconnect and, and really be disconnected. Whereas with a cell phone and people's demand on your time, you know, you can be at access at any time of day, anywhere in the world and they can come and find you on your cell phone, you know? So I like the idea of not having one a lot, so I was curious about it. As you were hosting Ride the Divide 10th anniversary thing, and uh, Joe Polk was talking, and just a lot of fond memories of you know the the first couple of years of trying that route and um, trying to find pay phones or you know a hotel lobby phone and calling that 800 number <laughs> and trying to think of what were kind of the the quick minute and a half highlights of, you know, the last 130 miles that you rode that day, you know, and give a location of where you're at and, you know, updating where what's going on and such and trying to make it a very quick, concise update. You know, I was thinking about all the ums and the the hesitation I had on a lot of phone calls and those messages that I called in and uh, just kind of the way technology has shifted even in the last 15 years is just kind of mind blowing to me. Yeah. It's cool. I didn't, I didn't know that you had tuned into that event. That was really cool that like Mike Dion is like, Hey bud, you want to do this? I'm like, heck yeah, I want to do that. Come on. (laughs) Like you're the man, you started this whole thing, but you're, that was a perfect segue, Dave, Fixie Dave into talking about your tour divide that was so well done you're a professional all those years calling into joe polk turned you into a professional podcaster and you didn't even know it (laughs) so let's just kind of start from the beginning because i don't know the full story i know tidbits you know here and there but i know that your first attempt was in 2006 it was on a fixie what led up to finding out about the Tour Divide? And I don't know if you did the Tour Divide or the Great Divide route, so maybe you could just tell me about that first time and how you found out about it and what made you want to do it. So basically what uh, triggered all of this craziness for, and you know, a 10-year-long obsession for me was reading an outside magazine about John Stamstead's individual time trial. And... Then going on the internet and seeing some of the stuff that Mike Kuriak had done. And so back in 2006, the first year that I did the uh, divide route, the Canadian section 
wasn't fully mapped out or part of the route, so to speak. So in 2006, I showed up woefully total noob. I'd done overnights. I'd you know, race my mountain bike. I'd pedaled long distances. I had done light touring. I'd pushed my limits, but I would not uh, done anything remotely as crazy as the divide. And I showed up on a surly cross check set up fixed with kind of a hodgepodge of cobbled together gear, which basically everybody in the middle 2000s there were, uh, you know, coming up with their own stuff. There was very little pro gear, so to speak. And I took Greyhound to Whitefish, Montana, and then pedaled to the start that year, which was Port Roosevelt, and crashed the night before and um pedaled to the start and uh from where from whitefish so i before the race even started i you know pedaled 100 miles or 80 miles something like that from whitefish to there actually i stayed the night before in eureka uh right on the border there and uh the next morning i actually got stung by a bee and took a bunch of Benadryl and pedaled to the start. <laughs> and the first day I pedaled out. Anyway, I ended up having a, a rough go of it that first year. And then outside of a spearfish, I was napping and uh, someone kiped uh, that bike and all my gear and uh, I ended up having to thumb it back to another big city in Montana. And uh, a buddy of mine who owned a shop at the time uh, wired me cash because I couldn't get a hold of my folks. I ended up greyhound hound and back only being on the route like four days after the bike got stolen. So that was my first Great Divide route uh, oh, experience. No. And uh, Where was the bike when, uh, it got, but, when it got liberated from your possession? Uh, I stopped at this park uh, on the side of the highway there, and uh, I must have really cracked. I, I mean, I was a little distance from the bike and the the park bench that I was, uh, and then where I chose to lay down and nap. Um, I must, you know, I don't know if I passed out a little harder than I was expecting or whatnot, but I woke up and bike was gone and the gear that was attached to it. So I don't know if somebody, you know, just tossed it in the back of a pickup truck or whatnot. Um, but uh, so that made for a, an interesting first time on route. Let me ask you about the first time. I'm curious. I mean, you only got four days in and you were stung by a bee on the way to the beginning. And you said you were woefully unprepared, but how were you feeling? I mean, you, you got to see at least a couple hundred miles or, or so of the, of the route. I mean, how were, how were you feeling about your preparedness and, and the enormity of what you were really taking on? Uh, it, 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 it was uh, definitely a shock to the system that first year. And it uh, had my bike not been stolen, I don't know how far I would have really made it that year. Golly, in 2006, I think there was only eight of us at the start mm-hmm. line. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there, there, it wasn't like a, a big crowd of folks or anything. And, you know, so it, it, it was it, a it very was obscure the, thing. The uh, Ride the Divide, you know, was filmed in 2008 at the inaugural, you know, Tour Divide. Um, so, I mean, that was too, you were like a way early adopter. So it was, remind me, it was John Stamets in 2005. So John Stamstead's. Uh, oh my gosh. First, Stamstead. Yes. Uh, Stamstead's first ITT was in 1999. Oh my gosh. Golly. I really uh, want to talk he, to him he, too. <laughs> he'd been uh, hounding adventure cycling and he got basically the, one of the first maps and was gung ho about it. And imagine, uh, you know, navigating 2,300 miles with a unproven map, <laughs> um, you know, a VETA cycle computer um, and uh, you know, kind of your gut intuition and a compass, uh, you know, no GPS, no turn by turn, whole lot of, uh, you know, unknown, so to speak, of, um, 
you know, what, what are you getting yourself into? So, you know, you're right. We can't imagine <clears throat> this past weekend. I spent three days scouting out uh, a new route that I'm working on developing here in East Texas. And we have right with GPS, we got Strava heat maps, we got Google, you know, we got uh, all the thing Gaia. I mean, I've got all the apps going, right. And I still ran into dead ends. I still ran into trespassing and all kinds of stuff, you know, we had to reroute. Of course, I mean, you know, there was the first time driving it and, and going over it all. But to think about just going off of a map, the, the way you said that an unproven map <laughs> across the continent is like crazy or across the United States. You know, it's, it's pretty wild stuff. Uh, you know, so, I mean, that first year I was going into it woefully unprepared, totally under budget. I was pretty dirtbag broke at the time, definitely a, a goofy situation. So, you know, <laughs> in some respect, maybe the universe was telling me that uh, you need to um, you know, get your shit together a little bit more, um, you know, before taking something on like this. But, you know, I was back there at, in 2007 in Port Rooseville. And, and did you get your um, shit together? A little bit more. So in uh, 2007, I managed to get 1300 miles done. Um, oh, I had wow. to pull the plug um, due to a seizure near uh, Teton, just a little off route. But uh, that year was interesting because uh, Matt Chester and Rudy Nadler, there was actually three of us on fixed gears uh, that started that year. So no that was kind of wild and crazy. And Matthew Lee had ridden to the start that year from Banff. He had scouted out uh, the adventure cycling Canadian section. He had thrown it out there to a number of us that were said we were going to do the race. And I just couldn't pull off getting up to Banff versus uh Roosevelt. Otherwise, it sounded awesome to me. I was like, oh, that sounds beautiful and great. And I'd love to include that, but I just can't pull that off this year. And, um, but, you know, I was pretty stoked at 1300 miles. And I was just, I was curious if any of the other fixies, you said, so there's two other fixies. Did either of them finish? Uh, no. I think Rudy got to maybe Steamboat that year. Um, I think Matt had to pull out around 800 miles in or so. Um, I can't remember exactly the, the numbers and, you know, where, where they had to pull out. That's blowing my mind. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you was if you had any sense for how many people have raced or ridden the divide on a fixie. And I was thinking the numbers would be very, very low. And, but you're telling me, I mean, in 2007, there was three of y'all and that's before the, you know, the first inaugural race. So, you know, that, that was still quote, you know, the great divide rather than tour divide. Right. Um, in 2008, I was the, you know, the year of the film and I'm in that just briefly that year, I was the only person fixed. Wait a second, you were buddy, in the uh, film. Tell me what, where do we find you in the film? In the very beginning, uh, I, uh, give a, a high five to, um, Matt Lee and I'm drinking beer at uh, the pre kind of race shenanigans just after the little John Stamstead speech. Right. Okay. Yeah. I know exactly. I'll, I'll look for you. You're famous. Uh, something <laughs> um, that year uh, I was the only one fixed and my buddy, Chris Plesko was uh, on a single speed and I had uh, caught a ride up with uh, Chris and his uh, wife, Marnie up to Banff that year of the film and uh i managed to catch a head cold and um i had to out in missoula there uh just because the cold got progressively worse and turned into pneumonia for me so only 500 miles that year wow so you've mentioned seizures a couple times what's causing those can you talk about that obviously something that you're having to deal with or you continue to deal with so I hit me in my early teens and through my late teens and early 20s, uh, saw a fair amount of neurologists have been poked and prodded in MRI and uh, EEG'd and whole slew of tests have been run on me. And um, I think at this point, my neurologist count is nearly 40 and they still don't know exactly what's going on with me. If it's epilepsy, most neurologists 
say that it's a uh, some sort of psychosomatic, which is basically the doctor equivalent of "I don't know, it's all in your head." Go see a psychologist. Oh um, my! Which is, uh, you know, when, when you're a late te- teenager, that's not real helpful. Still, occasionally have one. Is it uh, caused by? Str- I mean, is there something that triggers it, like stress or physical? Like if you get too tired or. Uh, or is it- Stress is definitely a big, giant trigger for it, but I've also had, you know, stuff in my sleep, and I've had them, you know, when I've been in, like, super positive, super relaxed situations as well. So I've kept a pretty pretty extensive diary over the years, and I can't make heads or tails of it. Um, so at this point, I just try to limit my stress and staying active rather than uh, hunkering down seems to help as well. So, you know, I've had very few when I've been riding the bike. You read my mind. That was my next Uh, question is if you've had one while riding and what happened? Only a few, one of them being in uh, 2016 on uh, the Route 66 route. I think I might have had one, um, not while I was physically on the bike. I knew enough was going on that I pulled off to the side of the road. I didn't just like all of a sudden start having an issue on the bike. One of the major difficulties too, is it seems to Swiss cheese my short term memory. Um, so I don't remember prior to the seizure, Uh, you you know, even 12, 24 hours prior, it's just really bits and pieces. And it's just a kind of a, but surely this is a fragmented file, right? Surely this has happened though around, you know, other people. So they, I guess they get, if other people around, they can feel you on the details, but if you're on your own, it's kind of like, well, I don't know exactly. How often do you get the seizures? I would say on average, it's about once every six to eight months or so. Um, uh, this past spring with all the COVID stress and added issues there, I, I had a pretty, uh, pretty rough spring this year. Uh, I think I had about six this spring. Um, oh, no. Um, Do you have to go to the hospital? Do they stick an EpiPen in you? Like, what, what happens? I wear a bracelet typically that says, you know, please don't transport, you know, don't take me to EMS, you know, here's the phone numbers to call just because that ends up being a very expensive taxi ride. And most (laughs) of the time they just, uh, you know, do a bunch of blood work, seeing if you're high on something or basically my close friends and those that know me know to just, I'll come out of it anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes I'm unconscious, but if, uh, heart rate or uh, uh, breathing doesn't typically get anything too crazy or wild. So it just it exhausts me. I'm my brain's working like a skipping CD after the fact, and then I you know proceed to pr- typically sleep anywhere from eight to fourteen hours almost after having one. I can imagine I, um, a friend of mine who lived in a, an apartment adjacent to mine, he would have epileptic seizures periodically. And I saw him have one once when I was at his apartment and luckily his brother was there. So I kind of just stood back and let his brother handle the situation. But it was a very kind of intense moment, you know, like his body was going through a lot of you know, you're seizuring, you know, like it looked, I can imagine you would be very tired after it. I'm wondering how has this, I mean, other than the health impact of, you know, having seizures, how has it, I mean, first of all, it's going to fascinate on the fact that you're riding tour divide or great divide on a fixie, but now we're talking about the fact that you have, you know, a, a health condition where you could have a seizure and you did have a seizure at what mile 1300 in 2007 so has it limited you at all or do you just kind of say fuck it let's go i try to uh, you know if i'm in a in a real bad space i don't start or you know if i feel like i have some sort of aura of what's going gonna happen to a degree so you know i i'm always also very leery of I don't want to make other racers or race organizers or, you know, to cause them to feel extra anxiety about, you know, what I deal with. So I'm typically pretty conservative, 
you know, if I'm feeling at all off or goofy, you know, I won't uh, start or I'll bail um, because I don't want to put anybody else in an awkward situation, so to speak. Yeah. The weird thing, well, maybe not the weird thing, but what I was thinking about is, you know, we all have spot trackers or whatever device we're using. And in most scenarios, unless someone has chopped off your arms or whatever, you can, you can just hit that SOS. But, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're having a seizure, you're not in control and you can't, you can't hit an SOS button. So it adds an extra layer of unknown, I guess. Just, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 unconscious. I'm out of it. So right. you know, unless something happened upon me, um, that's not a an option, so to speak. And I honestly, you know, if 2007 there wasn't spot trackers or anything like that, I simply called in to say that I was done for the the race. And then my mom uh, drove up from Colorado and picked my butt up um, <laughs> that particular year. Because, you know, I was in pretty rough shape. So you had a seizure. Where were you when you had the seizure? Were you out in the middle of the nowhere or were you around people or what? I think I had it in the campground at Coulter Bay in uh, Teton National Park. Basically what happened is you had a seizure, you went through the seizure, and at some point it stopped. And obviously you probably weren't feeling well, but you that's... You know, no one came to save you or anything. You endured the seizure however long it lasted and then pulled the plug. Yeah, I made my way to a phone and called it quit. You think about all the adversity that you have to deal with, whether weather, terrain, and you have seizures that, you know, can pop up from time to time. And even you are like, no, I'm, I'm going to ride a fixie. That's so incredible. I'm sure you've been doing this a while. You understand that this is remarkable to most people. Do you understand what it is about yourself that pursues you to tackle something that big on a fixed gear with the chance that you could have a seizure? I think there's kind of a bit of zen and focus that choosing not to coast and just keep the cranks turning. Um, I think it's kind of kind of a meditation and a just helps. I'm, I'm focused at the task at hand. And, uh, I, I think that helps, you know, my brain and its chemistry for its craziness, however, whatever is going on up there. And, um, you know, I think that's part of the reason why it has, uh, connected with me so much. I, you know, I think the best way for me to describe that I share a similarity with you, kind of. Um, I do not have seizures, but for more than half my life, I dealt with really bad anxiety, and it was exacerbated by exercise, which most doctors will tell you for anxiety, get exercise. But I would, you know, it would, without fail, I would, you know, every race I did, even on group ride, even on solo rides, it didn't matter. I mean, I get anxiety all the time. (laughs) I'd, uh, I'd I'd have to pull over and throw up on the side of the trail. And it was never a question of like if I would throw up, but just like how many times I would throw up, you know, and having to like deal with that. But um, yeah, the value always outweighed the uncomfort of those experiences, you know, at least for me. So we left off at 2008. Thank you for sharing that. That is actually, it's really remarkable. I am sorry that you have to deal with that. Um, obviously you've been dealing with it for about half your life or more than half your life now. So, um, I guess it's kind of been a a part of you, but it's unfortunate you have to deal with it. But I do want to hear the rest of your tour divide journey, because I know that you started in 2006 and you had five failed attempts. So do you want to just recap the five failures before we get to your glorious 2012? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 2006, a uh, bike gets stolen. 2007, 1,300 miles, starting in Port Roosevelt, have a seizure uh, en route. 2008, I took a break. 2009, I get this harebrained idea of maybe I should start south and go north. 
that year chose to ride entirely too skinny of tires. And um, at the time, my folks had a, a property pretty much uh, their the divide route had an easement um, through their property. The bike kind of steered itself toward that. And um, I only did about 1,200 miles that year. Um, <laughs> that year, I had had um, a very close friend die in his sleep. And that was about two months before the start of the race year. And then at the time, I was living in uh, Hurricane, Utah, and I had kind of been informally leading a group ride and had a gentleman get separated from us. He ended up uh, passing away out on the trail. And that was about a month before the start. And um, oh starting goodness. south solo, that was just a lot to kind of process and be in your own head um, for 1,200 miles. And um, the body was definitely willing that year, but uh, the mind just wasn't in the right spot for it and uh, I had to pull the plug. I can imagine that, I mean, bike racing is selfish, right? These long extended things, usually it's, it's a selfish and selfish endeavor. Whenever you have a friend or a close one, someone close to you pass away like right before, I can imagine that that would really put things in perspective and be hard to hard to focus on riding your bike. I, you know, and on the other hand, I could also see other people who would use that as a good way of therapy. So I really think it'd go either way, but I certainly can understand that being, you know, a heavy burden to be carrying on top of all your gear and the terrain and the weather. And, Oh yeah, you're on a fixie too. (laughs) Um, you know, and then, um, 2010, um, I started, I I like the whole kind of south to north, like less people, you know, not the mass start, uh, less hoopla and the idea of being more by myself and, uh, and also just kind of seeing everybody that was going southbound, um, being able to see them as, as I'm headed north. Ending in Banff is a heck of a lot better than ending in, uh, um, (laughs) You know, the border of New Antelope. Mexico and Mexico. Um, yeah. You know, it, that you is know, such a good point. And, and, I've never heard well, that before. That's so good. Why wouldn't you end in Banff? That's such a good point. It's such a better ending point, right? A uh, Coke machine that might be working. Yeah. Or, you know, a nice uh, resort town in the heart of the Rockies with, you know, you know, plenty of food and, you know, hot springs and all, all the co- creature comforts, you know, it just seems like it's, it makes more sense to end where, you know, there's a way to end, uh, you know, your suffering uh, rather than, yeah. me. but that, have you, have you brought this idea to Matthew Lee? I feel like this is a really good idea, Dave. I, I've also accused uh, some of the Southbounders of, you know, uh, shuttle riding because it's uh you know banff is a few hundred feet um higher than than antelope wells so you know uh they're they're you know ah uh, yes they're technically you know doing uh more of descent <laughs> good point good point all right well we'll leave that up to matt lee to decide but continue on with your journey so, and then, uh, uh, 2012, again, a, or no, 2011. Yeah. 11. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, on Greyhound, uh, going to, uh, Lordsburg, New Mexico. That's the Greyhound stop that I could access from St. George, Utah, which I was living at the time. And somewhere between Las Vegas and Lordsburg, New Mexico, Greyhound lost uh, the bike um, and my gear, and I spent uh, five days trying to track down my gear and and whatnot, you know, from a motel room in Lordsburg, and I spent four days there, and no sign of bike. Nobody could tell me anything. I'd you know, at the time I tried, you know, empowering the, uh, all the social media power I could was found. So I ended up taking Greyhound back to Tucson. 
I had some buddies there and I stayed with them. And finally they tracked down the bike. I managed to find it. But at that point I had uh, killed six or seven days and I didn't have enough time off from work at the time to pull off, you know, going back to the start and then restarting the whole situation. So, you know, I just called it quits, um, you know, before even pedaling anything oh, that year. Um, so Greyhound stole was, your 2011 run or lost uh-huh. it. Lost it. So, which brings me to 2012, which... Yeah, I need some um, good news, Dave. Uh, You've had... I mean, it's great. <laughs> you know, what I always see is, like, it's crazy you're like how freaking determined you are. Like almost every year you went back to try it again. And, you know, you had some like bad luck along the way. And I mean, I guess like that life doesn't always go your way, I guess, but I just, I, I'm so impressed by your like resilience, but I am looking forward to some good news. So let's hear about 2012. So, um, 2012, uh, my, uh, folks, um, hauled me to the start in Antelope Wells. And, uh, so I, again, went northbound and, um, had a smooth start cause you know, bike was with me, um, knew exactly where it was started, I think around 10 AM pedaled North. And by the time I got to the first day, I just got out of outside of uh, silver city and it started getting smoky. And, um, I had uh, been watching some of the wildfires in New Mexico. Maddie Lee had uh, or had emailed me in the uh, during that day, and until I got into Silver City this, the morning of the second day, I didn't know whether I was going to be going on route or if I had to take a detour around a fire. Mm. Which indeed, I had to take a detour around a fire in the Gila because the route was closed due to Forest Service. So I took a an approved alternate in the case of what was going on that year and um, proceeded to follow this pavement. And I was kind of always second guessing myself because I wasn't, you know, I didn't have maps. I didn't have a GPS file. I didn't have, so it was a little bit of wing in it and rode through a bunch of smoky New Mexico, probably was nearly a day extra there just in terms of communication and that sort of thing. But getting back on route just south of Pie Town. How are you feeling this year? I mean, you've had five attempts previously. Were you like really dialed in by 2012? And how, how are you feeling physically, mentally, you know, all, all of that? In 2012, I, I, I was a lot more flexible and uh, a lot more, I guess, ready to roll with the punches, so to speak. And um yeah, the gear was a lot more dialed. Um, you didn't uh, have the skinny tires. I was on a two inch uh, or two point two inch Pan Racer drivers or driver twenty nine er tires that year, which was a pretty low profile tread, but uh, worked really well on the route. So high volume, very low tread. Do you remember um, what your uh, goals yeah. were in 2012? Do you, do you remember? I know it was eight years ago, but... My goal was to finish. Yeah, preach. <laughs> at, at that point, uh, I, you know, I had, a, I had a very lofty goal in my mind of like 25 days, um, but that pretty quickly evaporated. Uh, I got to Pie Town, and I, I think it took me four days to get to Pie Town because of the the fiery detour and uh, breathing a bunch of smoke. Got to Pie Town, had my pie. The air was clearing. It was whoa, whoa, looking whoa, whoa. nice. Hold up, Dave. Hold up. You know I'm going to ask you what kind of pie you had. Um, I think I had uh, three slices of apple <laughs> and two slices of blueberry. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's one piece shy of the whole damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> well done, um, sir. Well it, done. A number of years I had to make up for that I hadn't had pie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. You had to eat a piece for every time you didn't make it to pie town. That's a good point. Then I'm getting on route. Stuff was going pretty smooth, and and I was starting to ramp the mileage back up. I was like, okay, I'm I'm starting to hit my stride. Okay, this is working pretty good. I get to the Colorado border. It's like 
I'm ahead of, you know, my other, you know, northbound attempts, not by a lot, but, you know, a little bit. And um, so I was pretty stoked when I crossed into Colorado. Colorado went pretty darn smooth. Uh, although somewhat outside of Gunnison, I had a pretty hard frost. I woke up pretty darn cold that morning. And then uh, there was a, a pretty good uh, belly washer of a thunderstorm that evening as I was climbing uh, Marshall Pass. Kind of was a, a, a downer, but uh, <laughs> rolled into Salida. Saw at the time uh, Scott Banks was working at Absolute Bikes, great mechanic and super cool dude. And um, saw him and saw Sean, who owns Absolute. And, you know, it was nice to see some friendly faces and was stoked to see them and stayed at the uh, hostel and Slida and got a pokey start the next morning um, out of Slida, which is going northbound. Um, out of Slida is a pretty little bit of a hurdy climb. And then you end up in uh, South Park. And uh, I'm pretty convinced that anytime I'm pedaling in South Park, the wind is just going to be in my face. It doesn't matter which direction uh -huh. I'm going. It just for whatever reason, that place in Colorado and myself, I always in pedaling into a headwind, it seems, was super stoked from seeing some friends and was in a good headspace and ended up crashing in Como and uh, had a super quick climb over uh, into to Breckenridge that morning. Um, ran into my friend Sonia Looney pedaling up. Um, the opposite direction and, you know, a little bit of buzz from just randomly running into a person I knew. And then um, Colorado just seemed to go smoothly. And then... Um, Do you happen to remember how many people raced in 2012? Because you'd be, you know, that, that's kind of cool to be able to go in, uh, you know, the counter direction to the people going southbound and, you know, kind of get a little pick me up every time you see one. So I, I think it was somewhere around 40 that year. And I think there was um, three or four of us that were individual time trialing northbound. I don't remember running into anybody that was time trialing going north um, that I remember. I, I ran into plenty of folks touring the route. 2012, I feel like this is a thing now. And, you know, it was rare that you would have a day that you didn't see someone else on a bike um, on route, which, you know, is kind of interesting. And then uh, I managed to get asked my uh, folks place on route <laughs> without stopping and uh, having the bike kind of steer its way there and that sort of thing. And um, got to steamboat, ended up uh, having a beer. And I think I had to replace uh, my pulse. One of those was like super squeaky that year and it was just driving me absolutely bonkers. Oh, so I, yeah. I ended up buying a, a new pair at Orange Peel they're in a steamboat stopped by Kristen's place, you know, before crossing mm -hmm. into Wyoming. And, um, what was funny is that year, uh, Maddie Lee and his, uh, his partner and his kiddos were actually running the ranch for Kristen. So I've never met Kristen, but <laughs> Maddie was, uh, running the place. So I got there kind of relatively kind of late afternoon, evening, Ended up having uh, some whiskey with him and uh, <laughs> spending entirely too long catching up with him. And um, this and is Matthew uh, Lee. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, checking. Yeah. Uh, it would be hard to leave a good conversation with Matthew Lee and a whiskey on the Tour Divide. You know, like, I mean, like you said, your goal was to finish. You weren't going for a time, and maybe you had a time constraint with work, but. You know, if you're going to give me some time with Matthew Lee with the whiskey in my hand, the tour to bike can wait. <laughs> yeah. So I think I, I pedaled um, a wee bit further, that, you know, another 10 miles or so that evening before I camped for the night. And then um, the next morning, crossed into Wyoming, which I was super stoked about. It, it, it was the uh, furthest I'd been on route and in the sh shortest amount of duration of time. And uh, I kind of started to have the thought process of, 
oh, maybe this actually can happen this year. And like, this might be doable. And, you know, I went to bed pretty, pretty stoked that evening. And, uh, you know, of course, the whiskey probably helped that. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Wyoming, at this point, um, it was uh, routed through, I think it's Ronsville, Wyoming, and then through the basin. It took me almost all day to get from uh, the Colorado border to Ronsville because of the wind. I ended up hunkering down in a uh, motel room in Rollinsville because of the wind. The next morning, you know, I set my alarm for like 3 a.m., like get an early start. And I stepped out of my motel room and nearly got blown over. And I was like, okay, I'm going to sleep in to a little <laughs> bit longer. And was it a storm? I woke up it? at seven and it was still, it just was. Uh, a windy, windy couple of days. And uh, it's not often that you hear Wyoming, Wyomians call, complain about the wind because it always blows up there because I guess Nebraska sucks or something like that. Um, <laughs> but um, it was super incredibly windy um, as I was headed into the basin. And um, that year, just as I was get turning off of uh, the pavement, I see Jay Peterberry and, and Tracy Peterberry on a tandem with a tailwind from God, um, <laughs> just screaming. And then they lock up the brakes and say hi to me. And, um, you know, we kind of exchange pleasantries and whatnot. And they were trucking along, especially on a tandem. So I started a little bit earlier than uh, a week before the solstice, which was kind of, is kind of the traditional tour divide st start. I started, I think, uh, June 2nd. Um, so they had already almost done half the route in a week's last time, you know, on a tandem, which was you know, amazing to me. So it was cool to see them. But as I turn into the dirt of the basin, I think I s spent the next uh, 18 hours pedaling at about three to four miles an hour through the wind. Um, it took me, I think, about 18 hours to get through the basin of pedaling time and about a six hour sleep in there. Um, and it was just the wind was uh, absolutely re relentless coming from the west. And a majority of the route at the time uh, through the basin was westbound if you were going northbound. northbound yeah. And um, it was pretty, uh, pretty crazy. I finally got into into the Wind River range and then the wind kind of let down and uh, it was such a relief. And back where there was like water and easily accessible water and uh but it, it took a lot longer to get through the basin than i had planned for then uh went pretty smoothly till i got into uh the entrance to teton national park uh i hit it like in prime time motorhome season oh, and if you're going northbound you actually have to pay to get into grand teton national park <laughs> if you're going southbound you don't the way the the route is uh there's no uh, gate you know on the dirt road that you end up entering uh grand teton national park so you know that's uh i think that you know the year i went through that was you know 25 bucks i think it's now almost like 55 bucks you know yeah, they if should, you're going they, northbound you know they should you alter the up. yeah they should alter the entry fee Dodging the motorhomes, you know, is kind of a shock after, you know, being on dirt roads for, you know, a bunch of time. And then uh, got into just uh, across into Idaho, you know, and it's like, OK, I got, uh, you know, Wyoming, uh, you know, off the list. And it's like I was feeling pretty good and was pretty stoked. I, I think I was at like day 24, 25 at this point, 26, maybe. And uh I, I get into Idaho and it's maybe nine thirty ten, and the sun's going down and it's kind of dark and I get across the border and I see this big large object all of a sudden pop out of the kind of the gutter and the drainage and cross the road. And I was thinking cow. Mm -hmm. And then it was, 
No, that's not cow. That's bear. Mm. No, that's not bear. That is big, giant grizzly bear. Mm. And after pedaling all day, you know, your brain's just not, you know, super sharp and quick. And we manage to avoid each other and we scare the crap out of each <laughs> other. And uh, so, you know, prior to that point, I was kind of thinking of where I'm camping out you know, and whatnot. And, uh, after that encounter, I ended up, uh, pedaling till nearly midnight to get some time between me and Mr. Bear. <laughs> and, um, Good motivation. And, uh, oh yeah. And then, uh, and it was pretty warm that evening. And I remember I just, I went for, you know, a lot longer that day than I expected. So I camped down and I was like, basically as soon as I stopped, like, the mosquitoes just attacked and I was like, I am so darn tired and I managed to get into my bivy, but it was so hot and sticky. But like, if you opened anything up, the mosquitoes w w would go crazy. Well, I realized I basically pulled off on this little side road and I was right next to a lake and, but you know, in the dark, I hadn't realized <laughs> it and, yeah. you know, <laughs> But I was so tired that I still, you know, slept six hours or something and got up and it was a, an experience in how quickly can I pack everything up and not get eaten alive as I'm doing so and get moving. And I did that and I managed to get, you know, get all the way through Idaho in one day, which I was stoked about. Whoa, and, yeah. and it was just I, I was seeing southbound divide racers, uh, you know, almost, you know, at least once or twice a day. And it was really cool to, you know, at that point, I knew almost everybody that, you know, was taking a whack at it, or I at least knew of them. And, um, you know, I get into Montana, and I'm like, oh, this is, this is incredible. I, I feel like I'm in, you know, the kind of the home stretch and making this happen. And when you are in the home stretch, you're right there. Um, for the most part, uh, Montana went like super duper smooth. Um, I, I think I had my first flat outside of Pie Town because my, my tires were looking a little, little threadbare. And uh, I'd had, um, I think in, uh, in Wyoming, I mentioned to, to my friend in St. George at the time to ship a pair of tires to the outdoorsman in uh, Butte. So I could have fresh rubber in uh, Butte when I got there. Um, that was the shop that that Rob Liepheimer owned okay. in, uh, in Butte. So you know, I was kind of I was like sh gunning for Butte because I had some parts, I had some a few little treats for myself, food wise, and you know everything in kind of my own like self care package. So I was kind of motivating for that. That was the first time that I would uh, after you know, South, uh, West Montana went smooth. I was cooking along pretty decently, uh, until I got to Fleece Ridge, um, which it, it kind of looks steep in the movie. It's not super great, um, <laughs> angle on it. Um, but you know, I don't care what you're geared at. It's, it's just a steep hike a bike, push a bike, a bike, you know, if you're going northbound and, uh, of course the bugs were, were pretty atrocious. So it was, uh, it was quite the fight to get up that. And I think I, it was kind of in the day, the evening hours that I did that. And then, uh, crash not too far from, from, uh, interstate, I think 15. Um, I was like, okay, if I'm, if I set my alarm, I should be able to get to Butte by, you know, midday, I can get stuff fixed and, you know, my tires changed out, all this stuff started to, um, catch up with me a little bit. So oh, it took yeah. me a lot longer to get to you than I had expected. Got to the, uh, outdoorsman about an hour before close. Rob was awesome. They, the, and his mechanic at the time, they just let me take a stand and do what I needed to do. And I ended up, uh, renting a cabin at, the KOA, you know, in Butte, um, and, uh, probably slept the hardest night. I think mm -hmm. I had slept, uh, all route. And, um, 
woke up pretty refreshed, but I woke up at like 9 a.m. And um, I was like, oh, crap, I got places to be and uh, <laughs> get rolling. And just am feeling really lethargic and um, run into a few people that, that kind of inspired some, some oomph. Probably, oh, maybe 15 miles outside of Helen, I had... Um, on my gear on a fork leg, one of the original um, salsa everything cages I hadn't noticed had cracked. And on the midst of this particular descent, uh, my sleeping pad had wedged between uh, my fork leg and my wheel. And I went insta over the bars and uh, used my face as a a brake pad. (laughs) Oh, no. Uh, this was like and, Helena, you say? Uh, uh, just outside of Helena. Yeah. And uh, as I get up off of uh, the ground, I uh, am wondering how hurt am I? Am I going to be not denied this yet again? Oh my gosh! Um, you know, after so, going that so far, um, doing a you know self evaluation, and um, I, I'm forgetting their names at the time, but, uh, um, I was kind of riding with a couple that was going northbound. Um, I'm, their names are escaping me right now, but, um, his, uh, birthday was that day and, uh, we ended up, uh, stopping in a bar. I had a bloody face and, um, <laughs> we had a few beers and I felt a little better after a beer or two. And I, uh, I think I, I, I couldn't find a uh, motel room, in Helena for anything, uh, that I could afford at the time. So I slept in one of the city parks in Helena and hit up a hardware store the next morning and rigged up some repairs so I could carry more gear, um, on the fork legs. Mm -hmm. I think I bought some kind of angled steel and, uh, you know, kind of fashioned a new, uh, anything cage at the time. And, uh, repaired that and hurt a lot, but kept on going and, um, went through Sealy, you know, like, you know, even though I was hurting, you know, like the rest of Montana was, it was a, a struggle and a push, but going well, I get to whitefish and I'm like, I think mentally I was kind of smelling the hay, so to speak. And I was <laughs> like, you know, I knew the route, I knew what was coming. And it was like, okay, this is, uh, I can I can make this happen, you know, cross the border um, into uh, Canada. Wow. OK, so I've done I've done <laughs> the Great Divide now, you know, yeah. like I, I've done that section, that twenty three hundred miles. So now, you know, I just need to finish up the the, the last little bit, you know, the and, change. Um, basically, as soon as I crossed into Canada, you know, I had only had like one wet day of on route. Oh, that's well, incredible. pretty much as soon as I started, uh, uh, into Canada, it, it rained and, uh, kept wet by the first evening of being in Canada. Um, I make it to one of the hunter sheds in, um, and I, I, at that point had been pedaling through wet, sloggy snow for about three hours and about two inches of it and got to this hunter's shed at probably close to midnight. And I was just crossing my fingers that, you know, if, if there was anybody else at this, uh, hunter shack that, you know, they'd be okay with this guy barging in, you know, at midnight because I was cold and wet and, and, and whatnot. So, Another, I, uh, I have to tell you, I just recorded another podcast just a couple of days ago with um, Katie and Andrew Strempke that just did the first ever yo-yo on the Colorado Trail Race. And uh, they're, the podcast isn't out yet, um, but they have a great story about sleeping in a, a toilet <laughs> together, a bathroom together. <laughs> uh-huh. But it, uh, we talked about it quite a bit because it's just a funny thing where you're like, I hope that toilet's available because I'm coming in. And they had three people. They had three people in that toilet. They had uh, Katie, and An- Katie and Andrew, who are partners, but then a third bike packer too. And they were like huddled in this uh, bathroom, you know, on the Colorado Trail. And I don't know, just a funny story. But uh, I can understand 
I, I just thought it was funny. Like I just had that conversation with them and they're like, Oh, I hope no one's in that bathroom. You know, and you're thinking the same thing. I, I get to the shed and, you know, in Hunter's cabin, Canadian parks, they've got strewn around uh, all of their park system. You know, I get there and nobody's there. It's great. There was even uh, kindling and tinder already set up in the wood oh, stove. So I was able to like yard sale everything and get it dry, get a fire going. And I, you know, slept pretty good and woke up to it still being wet and miserable the next <laughs> morning. But at least I was dry and I could put some dry gear on before I ventured out into the wet again. And um, I get into first Canadian town that I try to buy something at. And, um, I thought I had let my bank know that, uh, um, you know, I was traveling, you know, up to Canada. Well, they put a hold on my, uh, debit card. So I, uh, only had 40 bucks cash. So I bought as much food as I could <laughs> tried to call and try to get the bank thing situated. Right. So I bought food as I could, I think it was Sparwood, you know, and fortunately they took my uh, U.S. currency um, uh, without too much complaint and, and whatnot and, you know, filled up my bags as much as I could. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, it's bam for bust at this point. And right. um, I think this was July 3rd that that happened. And um, so I've been out a month, but I'm like, okay, this is, this is awesome. And, you know, I'm almost done. And, uh, my friend, uh, Jill Homer had emailed me to tell me that, Hey, my good friends, Keith and Leslie, they live in Banff. They're, they're, uh, awaiting you with open arms. Uh, and, um, and I was like, Oh, this is, Oh, cool. Well, you know, Jill, thanks for the introduction and, you know, thanks for, uh, you know, making this happen. Had one more night out. Yeah, so now you're, like, super motivated. You have, like, an extra reason to get to Banff. Uh-huh. So I ended up um, pushing it pretty long and hard uh, those last couple of days. I camped one more night out in Canada in the rain and then packed up and um, rolled into Banff at like 11 p.m. and uh, Keith and uh, I'm forgetting his buddy who owned a shop at the time up in Banff. They were waiting for me at the Banff Springs Hotel parking lot on the back of their pickup truck with uh, cold beer and pizza. And I have, uh, there's very few things I've been more proud and stoked to, you know, finally have gotten done after so many attempts and it was just so awesome to have this little mini party in Banff and then they hauled me to his buddy's shop and um they proceeded to get get like take out Thai food and then <laughs> uh, I think we ended up staying up until like 3 a.m at his oh shop and then took me home and I was definitely a little bit done um, <laughs> but, um yeah, I can't believe you. So you got done at around 11 and you stayed up another four hours. I feel like I'd be so tired. Like, thank you for the fanfare and the pizza, but now it's time to go to bed. Yeah. So, and then I uh, ended up uh, staying with Keith and his wife, Leslie, for another, you know, I told work that it was going to take me about another week to get home. And because uh, I had neglected to research that um, you can get a passport card rather than a passport, mm -hmm. but a passport card does not let you fly internationally. It just lets you do sea and land border crossings into the U.S. Oh. So I was thinking I would fly back to St. George, Utah, where I was living at the time, <laughs> and um, that was going to be a no-go. So yeah. um, I had to uh, arrange... Um, Greyhound from Banff, Alberta to St. George, Utah. Um, and it was a, a difficult 27 hours on a bus after being so active and pedaling for that long. Oh, yeah. And, uh, which uh, 
got me back uh, home, but uh, it was all well worth it. And well, so the bus ride. I mean, let, how were you feeling about yourself? Like after you know so many attempts, so much effort, time, money, training, all the things. Like, how did it feel to finally finish it? And I don't know. I'm just thinking about me on that on a bus ride, you know, because you, you you know after you get done, you're with your friends, you're having a little bit of a party, but then you get a bus ride and you're isolated and kind of alone with your thoughts. How excited or stoked or were you with your accomplishment? It was pretty, you know, satisfying, and it was also just, I don't know, how, I, I think I ended up sleeping a lot of that bus ride. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not stoked, I'm tired. <laughs> you know, the, the, the slow shift from eating everything in sight to, you know, trying to attempt to slow your met- metabolism down and, you know, not eat everything in sight, um, right. you know, is also is a hard shift, you know, post uh, divide attempt. No, I can imagine. So uh, one of the questions I got, um, one of the questions I got from Andy Holmes was, are you going to do another tour divide attempt? So it's been eight years. Are you thinking about giving another crack or do you got other things that you're wanting to accomplish? I feel like, I'm pretty satisfied on the divide. I don't, you know, I've, I've gone back a few times and toured some sections with some friends and, you know, had a lot more fun just dinking along at doing, you know, 50 or 70 miles a day for, you know, a week and just having a good time in Colorado or Wyoming. And, um, I feel like I, you know, I don't have any need to, race or time trial the, the the route again although there's always these you know random thoughts that i have of there there's so many things that i could have done differently you know now having done the whole route like you know what would have changed what would i do differently you know if i did do it again and you know if i didn't wasn't dealing with wildfires if i didn't have you know, and if I had had this piece of gear rather than that piece of gear, you know, how much of a difference would that have made? And so there's always that kind of in the back of your skull of, you know, what could I do to improve the time? But, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty satiated on the divide. I, I, I don't feel the need to, to, to race it again. Yeah. I mean, I get that. I mean, you spent a lot of your life on it or fixated on it or training for it or preparing for it, you know, and, and you accomplish your goal. So that begs the question, what kind of riding are you into these days? And do you have any other, you know, goals or aspirations that you're currently like looking forward to or training for? Um, so, you know, uh, with all the COVID craziness and whatnot, I've been mainly sticking close to home and, really just trying to um, explore everything that's open to me, you know, in the immediate vicinity and uh, trying to kind of leave no stone unturned and uh, (laughs) looking at old topo maps and old, uh, even doing some bushwhacking and and just um, really trying to get a good lay of the land and um, exploring and enjoying right here um incredibly blessed with an an absolutely amazing partner in life right now which you know has also kind of changed you know the optics of you know how i think of big events and you know what i'm doing and um so you know i don't have any like super big ambitious plans at the moment i'd really love to go um uh you know, there, there's so many cool routes that look amazing to just go and pedal. You know, I'd love to get to Iceland. I'd love to go to Scotland. Oh, Iceland. Uh, Are you following uh, Chris Picard right now? Uh, I'm I'm not familiar with that okay. name. He's, uh, he, he's mainly known for his photography. He has 3.6 million followers on Instagram. So you could definitely check him out there. Um, I've had a one episode that, um, I did with him whenever he did, um, the Iceland race, I, what it's called is escaping me right now, but it's, it's the ring road that goes around Iceland. He, he set the fastest time for that. 
And right now, as we speak, he just set off this morning, um, him, Emily Batty, um, Emily Batty's partner, and one other person are attempting to be the first people to, uh, you know, self-supported uh, ride the interior of Iceland. So if you're into Iceland, you probably want to check out his Instagram because it's pretty good. And uh, whenever he gets done, I'm going to have him on the podcast and we're going to talk about that. But yeah, and, and uh, Pepper Cook did Iceland too. And she and I chatted about that. I can't imagine Iceland. It is so, so beautiful. But also the weather, right? It's pretty crazy. I've pedaled the entire uh, Colorado Trail, but I haven't done it in one whack. Uh, that's on my bucket list. Although I'm, I'm not sure that it's the most appropriate route for uh, a fixed gear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's putting it mildly. Yeah. Yeah. Kate and Andrew Shrimpty that I just uh, interviewed were on single speed. Um, which was which was cool, um, but fix fix here, as you know, is a it's a whole nother thing. So you know, I I'm enjoying more just the explore and just being out on my bike, and I'm you know I'm not as into the trying to you know do something in a certain amount of time, or definitely more in the stop and smell the roses frame of mind <laughs> lately. So man, I can dig it. That's uh, that's where I live personally. I, I respect uh, the people who race and take on some of what I think are some of the most challenging physical feats that a human can endure, right? I mean, 2,700 miles over the Rockies on a fixed gear, and, and you might have a seizure as, as you go. You know, I mean, that is incredible, um, and I respect it, and I honor it. And every once in a while, I get the itch. I talk to a lot of people that do these things, and I get the itch. And I'm like, man, what can I do? What, how, how far can I push myself? But the way I, I picture it, at least, is once I'm satiated, you know, let's say I complete the tour divide like you did. I'm much more of a stop and smell the flowers kind of guy, you know? Like, I love exploring on a bike. It's what I've loved since I was a little kid. And what I hope I will continue to love is just getting on your bike and exploring and adventuring. What you said about COVID and being able to take that opportunity to focus more on what's around you. I've done the same thing where I'm, you know, we, we can't go and travel and do, and, you know, a lot of the races and events and all that stuff obviously has been canceled, but it's, it's really opened up a, a, a new world uh, that's closer to home, which kind of dove, dovetails into what I was saying earlier about how I was just scouting that route this weekend and, and really kind of focusing on, okay, what's, what's around me. So I can dig that. I have, this is my final question. Are you ready? Sure. <laughs> I'm sure that you get this question all the time. You've been riding Fixie for about a decade, let's say. Why do you ride a Fixie? That's the question I know that you've gotten many, many times over the last 10 years. Why do you ride a Fixie? But um, I, I imagine after 10 years, you have a pretty good answer. <laughs> the quick and dirty answer is, I, I think uh, riding fixed gear is like listening to disco music. It's not for everyone. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, I think, uh, it kind of gets back a little bit earlier, what we talked about in terms of, you know, that mind space that it puts me into, in terms of kind of that Zen and that focus of I'm simply pedaling my bike and I'm not thinking about work. I'm not thinking about you know, politics, I'm not thinking about um, anything else other than turning those pedals over and making sure I'm not pedal striking and keeping, uh, you know, my speed and my timing and my cadence where, you know, I'm not going to hit that root or uh, run into that tree or that rock. And I'm just trying to move, stay moving, you know, in, 
you know, where I'm at in nature and the universe right now. And um, I think there's just, um, you know, my brain really likes that sort of engagement and focus that that requires. I almost feel like it's like an art form, the way that you just described it. It's like an art form that you've like crafted over the years to, I don't know, be more engaged with everything. And I really appreciate the part about what you say about, you know, it just, it works with your brain. And that's something that I talk about quite a bit is that, you know, something that I really, really love about in particular bikepacking, self-supported endeavors is that there are about a billion ways to do it. You know, there's, there's all different kinds of people who are doing it. There's lots of ways to do it. The bikes, the gear, the procedures, the training, the whatever, whatever you want to say, but, but you just found your home. You found your home on a fixie and you're happy there. So you stayed there. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Well, I mean, you're fixie Dave. So at this point, you really can't become geared Dave, can you? I guess you could. Maybe when you get older, maybe when you're like 70, right? And you need some gears. Maybe, maybe you can be geared Dave. Uh, you know, I, I uh, <laughs> uh, don't, don't know if you know about a uh, frame builder out of uh, Slida. Uh, his name's uh, Don McClung. And uh, uh. I think he... I think he did a hundred mile ride um, in Slida on his 76th birthday on a rigid uh, single speed. Good. Not fixed though. Just single speed. Okay. Not, not fixed, but <laughs> single speed. Hey, I get that. I get that. My first introduction was Hal Russell. You're familiar with Hal, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You're familiar uh, with Hal. Hal is one of my favorite smiles from the divide. Exactly. He, I have a, I'm, I, I don't mean to be braggadocious, but my episode that I recorded with Hal uh, is one that's near and dear to my heart. He's a beautiful man uh, in every, uh, in every way. And uh, I got to meet him on his property there in Missouri, drove out and sat with him on his back porch and talked to him for a couple hours and he's one of my heroes, you know, he's one of the people that I look up to and say, if he can do it, you know, he didn't get into mountain biking until he was 57 years old, you know, and uh, completed, I, what has he done? The Tour Divide six times so far. And he's like 71 now, I think. Right. So, yeah, you know, I'm hoping I'm doing the same sort of stuff that he is, you know, when I'm his age. So, yes. Well, he's the person I point to, you know, when I'm sitting around a dinner table and people don't believe or they're too stagnant or whatever. Listen, there, I point to Hal Russell. He's the guy I point to and say, no, you can, at the age of 57, decide that you're going to do something and you can do it. And not only can you do it once, but you can do it six times. So he, he's a great example of what you can do what humans are capable of doing if we never stop moving and you know full disclosure before he got into mountain biking i think he was into ultra endurance running or or at least running um so he was an active guy you know but that that's kind of the whole point is if you just keep it going if you keep that engine engine stimulated you can just keep on going theoretically you know right mm -hmm. all right <laughs> What's next for you? Just chilling around Colorado Springs and riding your bike and that's it, huh? Yeah, you know, uh, depending on uh, COVID, maybe a uh, road trip to the Southwest. And um, Kate's never uh, been to the Grand Canyon or Zion or Bryce. And, you know, I think those are pretty magical, special places. You know, get a little road riding and uh, hiking in, hopefully maybe this fall or next spring, depending on what's going on. Maybe uh, the Leadville Winter Mountain Bike Race Series this winter, if you know, COVID allows, um, kind of just, uh, seeing what happens and, yeah. and, uh, how stuff's going, but, you know, I'm not, uh, making any hard firm fast plans just cause I, a lot of unknowns right now. So I'd rather not, uh, try to set myself up for disappointment. So. 
if you were going to have to be locked down and, and kind of isolated to one geographic location, you're doing okay. You, there's, there's a yeah, lot you, you can do there. There's good mountains. There's good trails. You know, there's a lot that's uh, quite positive right here. So, you know, yeah. there's, there's plenty to be written and explored, uh, you know, right out our backyard. So I'm pretty stoked on, you know, <laughs> where I've landed considering the circumstances. Yeah, well, I do envy you. All right, man. Well, good talking with you. Um, you're an interesting guy. There's not many people like you on, on planet Earth. You know that? I, I haven't run across anybody like me, so, you know, which would be <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better way to end the show. Thank you so much for uh, just being you. And uh, thanks for taking the time to come on and chat with me. And there's a million more things that we could talk about, uh, but we might have to save them for uh, another episode. Cool. Well, uh, you know, thanks for your time as well, Patrick. And uh, thanks for reaching out. I appreciate your questions. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's all good. We're all on the same team and I'm having fun and you're having fun. And uh, it's just nice to be able to talk to other people, you know, like I, you can imagine like when you were back in 2005, 2006, thinking about going on the tour divide, the limited information that you had, you know, but now we're in a position where, you know, you can listen to a podcast and you can listen to people who have been doing this for 10, 12, 13, whatever years and hear their stories and the progress, you know? So like, it, we're just so, I, I love it. I think that's what I'm, I just love it. I love, because I, I'm in the era like you are. I'm a 40 year old guy, grew up, you know, most of my life without the internet. And you see people doing incredible things, but there wasn't the internet and podcasts and all this stuff. Maybe we didn't know that Dave was on a signal speed. Maybe we didn't know Dave was also dealing with potential seizures or whatever, you know? So like, I get really excited about getting to talk to people that do this kind of stuff. I mean, it's inspiring. It's amazing. So uh, count yourself in that group, my friend, you, you inspire me for sure. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, no worries, man. All right. Well, wish you well in all the crazy world we got going on now, man. Keep the rubber side down. Cool. Ciao. Ciao, buddy. Have a good one. All right. All right. That's all we got for you all today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you to Mr. Nice for coming on the episode. It's so great to chat with you, and I'm grateful for the uh, fans of the show that recommended that I reach out to you. Well, Next week's episode is going to be with yours truly. My friend Ryan and I met up in Austin, Texas, and he interviewed me for the show. We sourced the questions from listeners. Um, so next week, you'll be able to hear me answer your questions. I hope I did a good job and y'all enjoy that episode. So that one's coming out next week. In the meantime, do me a favor, just take care of yourself, take care of your friends, your family, and your mental health, your physical health. And you know, it doesn't matter if you ride the Tour Divide on a fixie, on a single speed, or a geared bike. It doesn't matter if you ride your bike to the grocery store and back. It doesn't matter if you're going to the state park or a local municipal park and uh, just spending the day there. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that you ride your damn bike. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your boss, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes.